Hello everyone, it's Jean-Michel Grosje again, and so you thought that you knew all the rules you need to play High Frontier for All, the epic stellar game by Phil Eklund, and yes, you know how to fly your rocket, you know how to manage your industrial space empire, but there's a lot more in this game. There's dirt fuel or solar sails or air heater technology, all sort of space oddities that make this game so enjoyable. And that's exactly what the third video is all about, Space Oddities, the last chrome you need to enjoy High Frontier for All. Let's start with Dirt Fuel. Usual thrust triangles are blue because they use liquid fuel, the blue beads. But some thrust triangles are grey. They use solid fuel, also called dirt. There is no grey beads, dot fuel is never kept outside rockets. And basically, dirt grey fuel works exactly the same as regular blue fuel. You just use a grey wet mass counter to show that this rocket uses dirt fuel. This thrust triangle here gives a base thrust of 4, with a consumption of 2 fuel units per burn and the possibility of 1 point of afterburn thrust for a cost of 2 fuel units. Everything's normal. Ok, so what's the difference? First, dirt fuel is far easier to find. You can find it virtually anywhere in any quantities. After your rocket lands on a site, whichever size, with hydration or not, Whichever type letter, you can, as a free action, refuel it with dirt. In fact, that's part of the cargo transfer free action. You just have to figure out that dirt is everywhere on the surface of every site, so you pick it up and transfer it into your rocket. As much as you want. But still, you need mechanized arm to do that, so you need any card with an ISRU. Whatever its value. Any ISRU will do the job. Or you can also use a factory on the site your rocket is on. In our example, if Yellow Rocket brought a Robonaut with ISRU, here it's perfect because the same card gives the stress triangle and the ISRU, it can refill with any quantity of fuel as a free action. Up to the maximum load mass, of course. A card with an ISRU of 4 would have been ok, the value of ISRU rating does not matter. And even on a busted site, there's always dirt on any site. LEO not being a site, low earth orbit is just a Lagrange point so some kind of orbit, you cannot refuel with dirt at start when your rocket is just boosted to LEO. There, the only thing you can do is to convert your liquid fuel, your blue beads, into dirt fuel. For example, yellow player spends 4 blue beads from his LEO stack and adds 4 units of dirt fuel into his rocket, as shown by his grey wet counter. Just remember that blue liquid fuel is always superior to grey dirt fuel, so whenever you have a blue fuel, you can always convert it into grey fuel. One unit for one unit, but never the other way. And finally, with dirt, there's always a last solution for desperate cases. You can turn rocket parts into dirt fuel. Let's take this rocket. It has no fuel anymore and is lost deep into space. It needs some fuel to go back home or at least to land somewhere. Luckily, it has a dirt thrust triangle, so it can decommission some unused parts and turn them into dirt fuel. So, player chooses to decommission his refinery, for example. With a mass of 3, it can be converted into 3 units of dirt fuel. This is a free action called internal tankage. If our player needs still more fuel, he can also rotate his radiator card back to its light side and convert the gain mass. 5 minus 4 equals 1, one more unit of fuel. And now that you know all different ways to propel your rocket with liquid or solid fuel, Let's see the opposite side, how to move without any propeller. As we know, you need thrust and fuel to pay for burns. 
one burn for each pink dot and two burns for direction changes at Roman crossings. Okay, so as long as you don't enter any pink dot and never change direction at Roman crossing, you can move for free. Game rules call that coasting. You can travel Lagrange points, use flybys and even land and lift off. And this alone can lead you quite far. For example, yes I know this map is upside down, but in space there is no up, there is no down. Yellow player built a factory on IGR. IGR being a sea site, yellow player can build their black sea cards with ET production and so he can assemble a rocket. Okay, yellow factory could then produce fuel and fill rocket tanks. But let's suppose yellow player is in a hurry and cannot wait. His rocket must lift off now. It has no fuel, so it cannot do any burn. But still, it can lift off. Not a powered lift off because it cannot reach the thrust of six needed to leave IGR's gravity. But a factory assisted lift off is possible. It costs nothing but a hazard die roll. Okay, it passes. Lagrange points. Roman crossing, it stops. Next turn, Roman crossing again, stop. And then it goes on from crossing to crossing until it reaches Gaspra and land on it. This is a powered landing on a planet whose size is 1, perfectly allowed because yellow rocket's thrust is greater than 1 even if it has no fuel at all. Landing as liftoff doesn't cost any fuel. And so you see, how space travel is possible even without fuel in your rocket. In fact, at the game rule state, there's always a little fuel in any rocket, but not enough to have a full fuel unit. Okay, and now let's replay this space trip again. Our yellow rocket is coming, but this time it transports two white cards, a refinery and its generator, and also a robonaut. The rocket has a total dry mass of 11 and a wet mass of 11 also because it has no fuel at all. And this gives a net thrust of 2. Yellow player would like to land his rocket on Ariadne straight ahead because this site has an hydration of 1 and so refuel is possible with his Robonaut's ISRU of 1. But no landing is possible because you cannot land on a size 2 site with a thrust 2 rocket. And so here is the deal. At the beginning of his next turn, yellow player takes a cargo transfer free action to slide the refinery and generator he doesn't need into an outpost, just where his rocket is on the Homan crossing. This lowers the rocket's mass by 7 units, rising its net thrust to 4, thanks to the change of mass category. So now the rocket can land after passing through a hazard space. And all this without spending any fuel. Yellow rocket can now refuel with his robonaut and take his refinery and generator back when lifting off to the outpost. And so you can see all you can do without fuel, even using your thrust triangle to land or lift off. Mm, do you feel how you are slowly becoming a professional rocket engineer? And now that you can fly without any fuel, it's time to introduce the true eco-friendly rocket, Solar Sails. Solar Sails are special thrusters with no thrust and no fuel consumption. Zero, zero. How can such a thing leave Earth and fly? Let's play as grey player. Solar Sail is still an ID as a card in his hand. So first, he boosts it to LEO. It's free because this thruster's mass is zero. Then, he slides his thruster into a rocket. The rocket's dry mass is one because this is the minimum possible mass. And there's no fuel because no need. This thruster fuel consumption is zero. Base thrust is zero, but the rocket is so light that it gets a bonus of plus two. And let's go. First stop, the cycler. It's a burn, it costs zero fuel, but still, it's a burn. And with a net thrust of two, gray rocket can do no more than two burns. Then, 
Next up is the belt space. With a rad hard value of zero, we could think this is a dangerous space for our solar sail, but no, look, solar sails are immune to belt rolls. No need to roll the die. Next, a second burn, and this will be the last burn for this turn. This burn is free of fuel again. Then, Grey Rocket enters the lunar flyby that gives a one free burn. Then, a Lagrange point where it can freely change direction. Then again, a Lagrange point, and finally, Grey Rocket lands softly on Didymos. It's a net thrust being two, it can make a powered landing on this size one site. And did you see how far it went without any fuel and just solar push? However, you probably understood that it works only because it's very light. Such a solar sail can perhaps transport a crew or a robonaut, but not much more, and not the somewhat mandatory supply chain. Worst, because it has a sun symbol, it loses thrust as it moves away from the sun. Next turn, for example, our grey rocket will suffer a minus one thrust because it is now in the Mars heliocentric zone. That gives a net thrust of one. It is trapped on Didymos, unable to do a powered liftoff. And don't dream of going to Mars on a small budget because solar sails cannot enter any aerobrex space and then they are bound to go only to very small sites. Okay. Last thing before going on, the ballerina symbol, a small dancing woman, you can find on solar cards and sometimes on other cards also. This symbol gives a free change of direction, free of burns. So, with this ability, our Norwegian solar sail can start from LEO, first burn for zero fuel, belt space without any belt roll, second and last possible burn, a Lagrange point, then it takes its free direction change at this Homan crossing thanks to the ballerina. Then straight to this Lagrange and finally it lands on Deimos. All that in one move and zero fuel. Some cards have several ballerina symbols and so give one free change of direction for each little dancing woman. Last thing, you'll find in your space travel some strange zigzag line, which are in fact a collection of Homan changes of direction. Look here, no less than 11 changes of direction to go to the other end of this line. With two burns per change of direction, that is 22 burns or 11 stops, 11 turns to do the trip. This kind of zigzag line is the way the game represents very long distances to reach some foreign zones and planets like Neptune or Pluto. And now back to the ground, let's talk about buggies. As you know, some ISRU units shows a lunar buggy symbol. These units can re-roll any prospect roll and can prospect sites through yellow buggy path. Okay, you already know that. In addition, every crew card sharing the same space as the buggy unit can use this buggy as a free action to move along yellow path. I will pass on this one very fast because this action is seldom used in any actual game. Here, yellow crew can borrow a buggy from his robonaut and move to Mars Elas Basin, for example. Leaving his rocket, he must use an outpost token and put his card on the matching outpost stack. Beware, only the crew card can thus move only humans. The robonaut, its generator and the refinery stay behind in the rocket. So, in this particular situation, it can be dangerous because the crew card, having no buggy symbol itself, cannot go back to the rocket. Let's go on quickly to our next topic. Back in deep space, let's talk about PowerSat technology. This technology is aimed to concentrate solar radiations toward a spaceship in order to give it some additional thrust. PowerSat is a faction privilege belonging to green player if he chooses to play the European Space Agency. Every time this player activates a thrust triangle with the push symbol, it gains one bonus thrust. 
and that's it, very easy. Moreover, a player with this PowerSat ability can use factory-assisted landing for his spacecraft with a push symbol without the need of any risk die roll. If a player builds a factory and a site with the same push symbol, he gets that same power sat privilege for all his thrust triangles with the push symbol. So other players than green player can get power sat technology this way. And that's not over, there is another weird technology, the air heater refuel technology. It's a variant of the refuel operation available to rockets with this Pac-Man symbol on their active thruster or its support chain. Such a rocket can skim a planet's atmosphere to extract from it the fuel it needs. A rocket with this technology must stop on an aerobrake spot and shoot the refuel operation. Then, of course, it must pass the aerobrake hazard roll or avoid it by paying the FINAO cost and then it gains a number of fuel units equal to 5 minus its fuel consumption. Yellow rocket is approaching Mars, it stops on the aerobrake space, passes its hazard die roll and then, with a refuel operation, gains 5 minus 3 equals 2 units of fuel. Because the rocket had to stop on the aerobrake space to refuel, it cannot land on that same turn. Next turn, it can even stay there, roll again for the aerobrake hazard and refuel again. Now we have to talk about the solar calendar and the passage of time. At the end of every turn, first player moves his cube one step to next turn and when he crosses an event bar, he rolls for an event. One die, on a roll of 1 to 4, events are always the same, but on a 5 or 6, the result depends on current turn's color. There are three seasons, blue, yellow and red, and as we will see, each season has its own flavor. Some events are very simple. On a roll of 1 or 2, whatever the season, this is an inspiration event. From every deck in the market, take the top card and put it on the bottom of its deck. This refreshes the market and brings some new ideas. On a roll of 4, there is a pad explosion for all players. A pad explosion destroys, in game turns it decommissions, the heaviest card in each player's Helio stack. Crew cards are immune to pad explosion. The destroyed card goes back to player's hand, who can later boost it again to Helio. On a roll of 5 or 6 in yellow season, budget cuts strike every player. Each one must discard one card of his choice from his hand. Discarded cards go back to the bottom of their decks. Ok, then, there are still three events we didn't mention. These ones are a bit more complex, let's see them one by one. On a roll of three in any season, there is a glitch event. A glitch strikes each player bigger stack. A red disc is placed on it to show that. And from this moment, this stack becomes prone to technical breakdowns. This is what is called a glitch. Wherever there is a human, there cannot be any glitches, because humans are smart and can repair any technical breakdowns. So, no glitch red disc on a stack with a crew card. Helio stack is so close to Earth that a human can easily go there and fix any problem, so no glitch either on Helio stack even without any crew card. Taking all this into account, here for yellow player, a glitch cannot strike his rocket because there's a crew inside, nor his Helio stack because never in Helio. So, the glitch strikes his tallest remaining stack. From this moment, this stack keeps its glitch disk and that means that it will risk decommission every time it will take a glitch trigger action. There are six glitch trigger actions in the game. Every time you use a flyby to gain bonus thrust close to a planet, every time you prospect, you build a factory, you refuel, you deliver black card to LEO, or every time you transfer cards from or to a stack with a glitch. This is a glitch trigger and so you must make a glitch roll. 
You roll a die without any modifier and you decommission every card whose rad hard value is equal to the die result. No FINAO payment can avoid this roll and the glitch disk stays on the stack and triggers a new glitch roll with the next red dotted action. So, you understand how glitches are a pain in the neck that can last very long and destroy your best rocket or space station little by little. Only a human can repair a glitch. As soon as a crew card is transferred to a stack with a glitch, this glitch is removed. Removing a glitch is a free action. On an event roll of 5 or 6 during a red season, you get solar flares. All cards traveling through space are hit by some sort of solar storm. Players roll one die for each of their stacks, rocket, outpost, and they add to this roll the heliocentric modifier of its zone. The closer the stack is to the sun, the higher the result and the more dangerous will be the solar flare. All cards whose red art value is lower than the result are decommissioned back to player's hand. A stack in a belt space is shielded by the planet's magnetic field and doesn't have to roll for solar flares. This is especially true for Earth belt spaces, Earth magnetic field also shields LEO and cyclor spaces. Of course, belt spaces around the sun itself don't shield against solar flares. There are 14 such belt spaces around the sun. And finally, all stacks landed on sites are immune to solar flares rolls, and that means that only stacks actually traveling through space take the risk of solar flares. Also, during all red season's turns, when a rocket passes through a belt space, its belt roll gets a penalty of plus two. This is not an event, but a penalty that applies during all red season turns. This, added to the risk of solar flares, makes that space travel should be avoided during red season. Finally, on an event roll of five or six during blue season, a state of anarchy begins that lasts for all blue turns. Anarchy means that players can perform felonies. There are three felonies. These are special actions that are normally forbidden but become available for all players during times of anarchy. The first felony is claim jumping. To do that, you must bring your crew card to a site with an opponent claim disc. And then, as a free action, you just replace it with one of your own discs. So doing, you steal ownership of this site. Like all felonies, you need a human to do that, and if an opponent human is there, you cannot do your felony. Claim jumping is not possible if there's a factory on the site, just a claim disc. The second possible felony is a factory hijack. Very simple, with your crew present and no opponent crew to stop it, you can perform a refuel operation or a factory assisted landing or liftoff on an opponent factory, but to your own benefit. And third felony, murder and suicide. This one allows you to decommission one of your own crew. As you remember, you can decommission all cards as free action during your turn, but not cards with human inside. And so, if your crew is stuck on a distant planet, you have no other choice than to send a rocket and bring it back. No choice but during anarchy when you can just kill them, that is, decommission their card as if they were a mechanical part. And that's it for the three possible felonies. Also during anarchy, players cannot use their factory privilege. As you know, each player has his own faction privilege written on his crew card. If anarchy is rolled as an event, these faction privileges are ineffective until the end of blue season. So we can say that during anarchy, felony becomes the only privilege for all players. A game cycle is made of 12 turns that match a full cycle of solar magnetic activity and roughly 12 years. Some comets revolve around the Sun according to this same cycle and become close enough to be reached only during short periods of time. 
These are synodic comets. Like the sectors on the Sun cycle, there are three types of synodic comets, blue ones, yellow ones, and red ones. These sites are outlined with the color of the Sun cycle, blue, yellow, or red, so are the one or two Lagrange points before the site. That means that a rocket can enter these spaces only during a turn of the same color, and that gives you only four turns per cycle to land on it and lift off. Let's now talk about the Moon. Our Moon, the one which orbits around Earth, it is made of two sides with a size of nine. And as you know, at the beginning of the game, the designated first player gave one of his cubes to be used as a turn counter. And so, first player has one less cube than the other players. And that's one factory less he will be able to build. So, first player gets a benefit in compensation. And this benefit is some kind of property right on the moon. Every player who wants to claim any site on the moon, that is, who wants to put a disc of his color on these sites, must ask the first player for permission. If the first player declines, no one can put a disc on the moon. Note that despite this prohibition, a player can still claim a site on the moon without first player permission as a felony that is with his crew during an anarchy event. So, as you can see, player will have some time to debate and to negotiate, and it's time to see what they can give and take during such negotiations. Players can negotiate whenever they want, and here is the list of what they can negotiate. They can give aquas to each other. Aquas are fuel blue beads located in LEO, and because all players share that same LEO spot, they can transfer aqua freely from one bank to another. Players can give cards from their hand. These cards are IDs or patents, so they can be freely exchanged. They can trade ownership, ownership of cards, claims, factories or colonies. They just change discs, cubes or domes colors, For cards, a player can give cards and the player who receives them just creates an outpost to stack them, like a standard cargo transfer but between two players. They can transfer abilities such as their faction privilege. Green player, for example, can offer to give a plus one thrust push to another player's thruster with the push symbol. Or a player who owns this black side refinery can offer the power to change a busted red disc into a claimed disc of your own color. Player can give the use of their equipment for factory assisted landing or lift off or refuel operation. For example, yellow player could buy the right to refuel his rocket at a red factory. Or they can even hire their factories for an ET production, for example. And finally, a player with his crew on an opponent's site with an opponent stack can propose to repair a glitch on this stack. And so, never forget that High Frontier for All is also a negotiation game and that a good deal with your neighbor can save you a lot of time or a lot of trouble. Okay, and now, just before concluding, a last word about heroism you'll find four special victory cheats in the game, each worth two victory points. They are available from the beginning on the edge of the map. And you should see them as the role-playing factor in High Frontier. Each heroism token is made for a special circumstance. The first one should be granted to a player suffering a devastating event. The second, a loss of human life. The third, to a player who helped an opponent, and the last for newbie miscalculation. All these notions are fuzzy on purpose. It is up to the player to decide when and to whom they will be granted. A player makes a proposal, even to nominate himself. Everyone votes beginning with the first player, then clockwise. If there's a majority of votes, the token and its victory points are granted. Each token can be given only once in the game. Typically, they should be used to comfort an unlucky player. 
They are light-hearted and should be not taken too seriously by other competitive players. And that's it for the core rule set of High Frontier for All. Let's call it the vanilla game, but it's enough to start and have a lot of fun traveling through the solar system. Perhaps you will need some plays to get comfortable with this rule, but I'm sure you'll quickly become as skillful as an actual rocket engineer. I hope you'll enjoy the trip through this wonderful game, and I'm looking forward to having you back here in Jean-Michel Grosje's workshop of Heavy Games, where we will together dig deeper into High Frontier with its numerous modules, politics, terawatts and futures, colonizations, wars, and much more.